Well, good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us today. Although the coronavirus pandemic and the US election have dominated the headlines in Germany and the United States, other important issues deserve our attention. One of those issues is Brexit and the future of the European Union without the United Kingdom. Although the United Kingdom formally left the EU on January 31st, it has continued to follow the bloc's rules until the end of this year. This 11 month transition period was supposed to allow both sides to reach a post-Brexit deal, but deadlines for completing a Brexit deal have come and gone and time is running out. Joining us today to talk about Brexit and the future of Europe is Dr. Peter Wittig. Herzlich willkommen, Peter. Schön, da zu sein. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Steve. Peter Wittig, of course, is a familiar face for many of us. He recently retired from the German diplomatic service, and he's now working as senior advisor for global affairs at the Scheffler Group. He is also a Fisher Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. During his time in the German Foreign Office, he served in Spain, Lebanon, Cyprus, and Berlin, and in the cabinet of two foreign ministers. Most recently, he served as the German ambassador to the United Nations in New York from 2009 to 2014, representing his country in the Security Council. He also served as the ambassador to the United States from 2014 to 2018, and as ambassador to the Court of St. James in the United Kingdom from 2018 to 2020. So we have a real expert when it comes to what's going on in the UK right now and in Europe. Earlier today, Ireland's Prime Minister, Michael Martin, said that he hoped the outline of a Brexit free trade deal would emerge by the end of this week, despite what the European Union's negotiator, Michel Barnier, described in a tweet as, quote, fundamental divergences, end quote, between the EU and the UK. Peter, what's the likelihood that the UK and the European Union will reach a deal before the end of the year, let alone the end of the week? I will give you a number. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me uh, applaud you for the timing of, of this discussion, because this is really crunch time. You know, we are in the end game of the end game. And literally speaking, um, you know, as we speak, uh, you know, people are negotiating in the tunnel. Uh, in Brussels, and uh, we don't know where, uh, you know, they will come out of the tunnel in a couple of days. But I, I'm optimistic, and I would say 70% likelihood of a deal. So that's actually pretty positive. <laughs> um, Peter, where, where do you see some of the um, enduring flashpoints? I know that fishing rights seem to come up over and over again. Um, but what are the real Reibungspunkte yeah. to trying to reach an agreement between London and Brussels? I think there are basically three difficult issues yet to resolve. The first one, as you mentioned, is fisheries, which is insignificant. Uh, if you look at the uh, you know, percentage of the fishing industry uh, in relation to the whole economy, economically speaking, it's uh, a marginal industry, uh, but it is of highly uh, you know, charged political sig significance. Think, think about sort of the, almost the, the, the fishing wars in the past between France and, 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 and the UK, uh, the, the trailers uh, you know, attacking each other, the, the, the fishing boats. And, and so for some countries in the European Union, about six or seven or eight countries, it's really important politically. And for the UK, it's extremely political. Yet I think since you can deal with numbers, you know, quota, and you can deal with timelines, and you can sort of uh, deal with uh, negotiating or renegotiating quotas, this is a solvable issue. A second, um, probably most difficult issue is the so-called level playing field. That is, 
uh, the, the notion for the alignment of the United Kingdom in future to the rules and regulations and standards for, of, of the European Union. So from a EU point of view, uh, this comes with the access to the single market. If you have access to the single market, that's the EU logic, you need to adhere to the rules and regulations. Uh, the UK has a different angle. Uh, it says uh, it wants to basically maintain its uh, independence and sovereignty. Uh, they, the UK says, well, uh, you can rely on us that we will not deviate from environmental standards or labor laws, but we might have a different um, you know, uh, assessment of state aid, which is an important tool uh, for uh, supporting industries in the North, for instance, or tax rules. So this is um, a very tricky fine line to walk. Uh, the EU does not want giving, does not want to give access to the UK to the single market and at the same time encourage the UK to be a competitor by outbidding the EU on rules and regulations. That's a difficult assignment. Um, yet, I think there is also uh, room uh, for, for compromise here, but it's, it's also symbolic because it's sort of about sovereignty, right? And the third issue is what, what is called governance. That is um, basically the enforcement mechanisms, if there are, uh, or arbitration mechanisms, if there are divergencies between the two partners, the EU and the UK, for instance, of violations um, of the agreement. Um, now the EU uh, wants an arbitration process with the ultimate arbiter of the European Court of Justice. And the UK of course does not want anything like it that sounds like you know, an intrusion of the European courts into British uh, law. So that, that's also a different, a difficult issue to resolve. Again here, I think uh, it can be solved by complexity, by introducing complicated layers of arbitration here. And um, so in the end, um, it's a political decision. Uh, will Boris Johnson sort of uh, uh, walk the talk and, and will he sort of cross um, uh, the, the threshold and um, you know, uh, decide that he wants to be aligned to the European Union or not? Um, or does he fear that this is too hard a sell for the hard Brexiteers in the Conservative Party and the parliamentary group on which he, in the end, will be dependent in the future? My take is that the economic situation um, and, uh, you know, the repercussions of Corona and other reasons um, compel Boris Johnson not um, to look into the abyss of a no-deal scenario. So, Peter, you, you said it's it's a political decision, and I guess sort of one of the burning questions that that everybody has is whether the political will is in fact there um, to come to some sort of an agreement. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that that Michel Barnier underscored again in, in his uh, tweet today to say that from, from Europe's side, the political will is there. From what I'm hearing you say, it sounds as though Boris Johnson has the political will as well. Um, but, but how do you think that might play out? It, you know, in the end, I think um, the prime minister uh, is calling the shots. He will convoke, as he's done before, a, a small cabinet committee um, in which decides, but they will go along with him, although uh, there might be divergences in that cabinet committee. But in the end, I think they will follow uh, Boris Johnson. And the reason why I um, expect a deal to be struck um, are, you know, a, a couple of important considerations. First, uh, you know, a very bad economic situation after a very bad corona handling. And um, 
sort of this would be exacerbated if Boris Johnson says, you know, after month and month of negotiations, we didn't reach a deal. Second, the risk to the industrial north, because manufacturing would be the main victim of um, sort of emerging tariffs. You know, let's not forget if there's no deal, uh, the UK will have to to deal to trade with the European Union according to the WT World Trade Organization WTO rules, and they envisage quite hefty uh, tariffs. And and then there are more political reasons. Scotland will, in a no deal scenario, continue to drift away, and also Northern Ireland will be totally unhappy with this. So there is a question of the cohesion of the United Kingdom here at play. And the last, but certainly, I would say not least reason is President Biden. He's not a friend of Brexit, and he was very vociferous about it. His designated foreign minister, uh, you know, uh, Tony Blinken, um, is certainly not a friend of a weakening of the European Union. So he does not have an ally anymore across the Atlantic. I think the situation would have looked differently had President Trump carried the day. But with Biden, he knows he won't get that easy trade deal, the most beautiful in the world, with, with the United States. So that has shifted uh, you know, the configuration of forces. And that's why I'm pretty optimistic that in the end, we'll get a deal. So I'd like to, to come back um, to the, the implications of, of Biden's election uh, a little bit later in our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to drill down a little bit on, on the Northern Ireland um, issue. Um, I'm happy that you mentioned it because I was, I was sort of surprised that you didn't mention it as you were listing some of the flashpoints, um, fisheries, the level playing field, um, as well as governance, because it seems as if the question of, or the questions around the Good Friday Agreement are one of the, the real topical points that need to be addressed as part of, um, of the, the Brexit discussions. Mm. You know, um, Steve, um, the Northern Ireland issue was basically settled with this withdrawal agreement that was concluded last year in October. It was ratified and it entered into force in January. So um, this is what the EU and uh, the UK uh, finally agreed upon. And it meant uh, that Northern Ireland could be aligned to the European Union could have access, but the downside from the, you know, from the British angle was that there was, or still is, a, a kind of a border between the UK and Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. sort of a sea border, and this is obviously something that you know all the Brexiteers hated in a way, you know. But because one didn't want to have a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the necessary customer and regulatory controls that have to take place will now take place at the sea border. Now, we thought this is settled, you know, this is an agreement and, and, and this is, you know, the way things are being handled in the future. But then um, a couple of weeks ago, um, to our surprise, um, the Conservative Party um, agreed to table a law so the, called the uh, Internal Market Bill, um, revoking or contradicting some of the provisions of that withdrawal agreement, which created an uproar in parts of the UK. You know, you, you, you might have heard that parts of the Conservative um, grandees um, uh, uh, distanced themselves from Boris Johnson, and there was a huge loss of trust in the European Union because we thought, how can we trust somebody who says what we signed is not valid anymore? And sort of, they even admitted that this was um, a violation of international law. So you're right in pointing that out, and that is 
still sort of an outstanding uh, disagreement. And of course, the European Union, um, if there's an agreement, would insist that this uh, internal market bill, as it stood at the beginning, would not enter into force um, because uh, that, that would uh, undo uh, a deal that we had on Northern Ireland. And I think Biden comes in here again. Yes. He has made clear, I mean, he's of Irish origin. I mean, his, right. uh, I, I think he, he's very focused on this. So if, um, if, if, if the Irish are unhappy with anything that we uh, agree upon, he, he would probably uh, say so. Uh, so the American president is, you know, an actor here, although not in the arena, but outside the arena. So in, in that regard, I'd like to, to fold in a, a viewer question. Um, one of our viewers asks whether the election of Joe Biden will move the British closer to a deal with Europe. In a way, I think um, it um, uh, made the choice almost, that's my view, almost imperative uh, to conclude a deal uh, because uh, in, in a case of no deal, um, uh, the UK would be in a weak position vis-a-vis -vis the USA and, and all this philosophy of global Britain um, could not come to play. Uh, and, and it would have been different with um, a President Trump because uh, I, I'm sure the uh, Prime Minister and the President Trump could have agreed on a uh, beneficial uh, trade deal, President Trump being a great fan of, of Brexit and sort of uh, th this, this is in line with his, uh, you know, America first philosophy, his disdain of the European Union, really. So, um, but the situation is different now. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, a, that's quite an important factor to um, take into consideration for the British Prime Minister. So another viewer question that, that ties into the Ireland conversation that we were just having, uh, one of our viewers would like to know whether uh, or what might happen to Ireland if there is a hard Brexit and whether or not um, Irish unification is more likely in that case. Well, um, I, I would say um, if there's a no deal, um, it, 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 it makes most of the Scottish totally unhappy. And, and it would make also um, many people in Northern Ireland unhappy because they, they, they would feel they are uh, drifting away from uh, the European Union and, and the single market. And I think it would not be sort of a kind of a big bang, but it would be a reinforcing the, the drifting apart uh, of England from Scotland and from uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, Wales is, is, is a different story, but um, also there's a Welsh nationalism in a way. Um, so uh, th that's a consideration that also, I, I guess, must be on, on the mind of the conservatives. Uh, because they are the unionists, you know, therefore this is in their blood or supposed to be in their blood, uh, the union of the United Kingdom. Um, so, so that makes me hope that there will be a trade deal. But I, I also want to emphasize a trade deal in any case would be a rather slim trade deal. It would not be a very comprehensive and, and deep trade deal. And, and what is probably, um, I, I would say it's, it's sad that we could not um, bring the UK um, over to the philosophy to have a more comprehensive uh, agreement, including political cooperation, including cooperation in the security uh, sphere, including cooperation in the cultural and university field, etc. The British said, or you know, the, the, the negotiators said, we don't want such a comprehensive deal. We want to do that bilaterally with the 27 member states individually. We want just a trade agreement with the European Union and the rest will be done bilaterally. And I think this is uh, something, it's a missed opportunity. 
uh, to keep the UK and the EU together on, as, as a political and security force. And it also has negative re repercussions for young people, for instance. You know, we have no agreement on Horizon 2020, which is a Europe, EU program to foster uh, cooperation in research and, and um, you know, university uh, research and, and partnership. We have no agreement on fees. So European students uh, who want to study in the UK will have to really pay a lot more. It's almost American style fees. So, I mean, that, that will hamper this, this, this social interaction. And it, it's, I, I think it's, it, it's a shame that one missed the opportunity here to, to open up the European Union for younger generations. And, it's it's um, but it's what what what, what this uh, you know the UK or this government want? Absolutely. I mean, I think that I think there is perhaps at this point you know some some regret um, about Brexit uh, in a, a recent uh, Pew Research poll. Um, Sixty percent of Britons have a, a favorable opinion of the European Union. Hmm. Um, that's the highest number since polling on the subject began in, in 2004. Oh. Um, and I think part of that might have to do with the way in which Europe has handled the pandemic, but hmm. part of it might also have to do with the way, um, with the realities that people are seeing um, of the Brexit moving closer and closer. Hmm. And one of our, our viewers says um, that it, in your comments so far, you, you keep making the assumption that Britain's action is based on rational calculations. But Brexit in many senses, as, as you know only too well, um, is about emotions and not necessarily about rationality. So when you were ambassador, um, how did you deal with some of those emotional issues? Well, there were, of course, emotions, and you're right about it, on the two sides. I mean, it was a divided public opinion. I mean, I think the, in my time, the, the Brexit camp in society was as strong as the Remain camp, and uh, the polarization was not as toxic as I would say in the United States, but also uh, family uh, friendships uh, broke apart, or fa family relations suffered, and friendships broke apart about that, about that issue. So, um, and this will not go away. I, um, I, but I think with this clear election result um, in in December, when Boris Johnson carried the day in an impressive manner, um, having a majority of more than eighty. Uh, members of parliament, uh, it was sort of a kind of second referendum that that basically settled the issue. And from that moment on, the Remainers, I think, resigned um, themselves to, 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 to their fate. And, and so the, the, the Remain movement kind of evaporated. And, and I, I would say people sort of withdrew into sort of, you know, private uh, feelings and private conversations. And there was no, um, and the Labour Party, um, Keir Starmer, who was a very able, uh, rational and, and uh, down to earth, but also uh, extremely, uh, uh, you know, uh, strong uh, leader of the opposition is, um, is basically has dropped the issue because people just wanted to get over it. And that was the main feeling. And, and, and I think now they, it, it kind of comes back uh, to, to, to haunt some people, but now the issue is more about Corona and, and the economic recovery, things like that. So, Peter, I had wanted to ask you to, to talk a little bit more about what the UK's relationship with the EU might look like when it leaves the single market. Um, mm. But we've actually gotten a couple of other questions that tie into um, the, the economy. One viewer is curious as to whether or not the British economy is strong enough to go it alone. 
Um, and another viewer writes that, of course, we've known about Brexit for years at this point, and companies have had four years to prepare for it. Um, if there were to be a hard Brexit, are companies actually ready for that? Yeah, uh, two interesting uh, questions here. Um, uh, th there, there are estimates in terms of economic damage. And, and one government estimate says that um, with a deal, even with a deal, um, the UK uh, will uh, suffer a loss um, of, um, uh, uh, miss out 4.9% uh, um, of future income over 15 years. And without a deal, so a no deal scenario, it would be 7.7% um, of um, income over 15 years. So that's the government assessment of economic damage. Um, so it's there, it's there. But I, uh, on the other hand, um, never underestimate the, the resilience of, of the British, you know, the mindset, but also the economy. I, I don't underestimate um, a great spirit of innovation. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very um, service um, sector oriented economy. Uh, manufacturing, so the traditional industries are just 10%. And many of the service, much of the service sector is, is, is rather innovative, um, is, is active in the, in the uh, new tech industries. And, and so I, I, I think the UK has potential. I'm, I'm skeptical about the philosophy of global Britain in, in terms of um, go it alone strategy. I, I think that is in this world of interconnectedness that, that is um, very hard uh, to um, to implement. So I I, I believe um, the uh, you know the dependency on the European Union will still be there, um, and I, I I just hope that um, you know uh, we 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 can find an arrangement with or without deal um, without a deal um, to to move back together again. Well, and I think that's an important point. As, as one of our viewers uh, just, just wrote to me, um, Brexit is, is also bad for Europe. Um, mm. Obviously, it, it, it hurts Europe as well. Another viewer is, is curious um, as to which companies or which um, sectors on both sides of the channel might be most vulnerable to a, a hard Brexit. The auto sector is affected. Um, because in the case of no deal, we would have uh, all of a sudden uh, quite high tariffs. Uh, if you have to trade according to WTO rules, uh, there are 10% tariffs on cars. Um, so um, the UK is a sort of a medium sized uh, automotive power, but that used to be very strong. It still is strong, although. Um, it's all of foreign owned, you know, it's BMW or it's Tata, Indian um, uh, company, et cetera. But um, the UK also exports cars and, and that would suffer enormously. There are Japanese uh, cars being produced there and they would suffer. And this would hit not only the car industry, but all the, all the suppliers that depend in the north on on in the north of uh, the UK on, on, on this manufacturing industry. So I think uh, those classical manufacturing industries, also um, the, the aerospace industry, I mean, they are in a, in a bad place anyway because of Corona, but they would suffer as well. And, and everywhere where there is um, a, a very complicated supply chain uh, of the industries, you know, a, a highly, a sophisticated supply chains, a, a no deal would harm those industries. The financial industry, I guess, would not really suffer greatly. Um, London remains uh, the major economic financial hub in Europe, and that will stay that way. And 
Um, I think also some of the startups that have been flourishing in the UK would not really suffer a lot. Um, so it's a mixed picture. And what about agriculture? Yeah, th that depends, um, you know, uh, on whether uh, the government is ready to compensate uh, the loss of income for the farmers. Loss of income because they can't export um, that much anymore. And loss of income because they're, they're not recipients of the structural and um, uh, regional um, funds that the uh, uh, they're all the member states of the European Union benefit from. So um, th that it depends, you know, whether the farmers then turn to the government and say, please, um, you know, uh, supplant uh, what we have lost from the EU, uh, give us the funds. Uh, and that, that would be costly. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that optimistic for the UK that uh, they can you know, incur further debt with everything they had to um, deliver now in, in the recovery uh, programs uh, uh, after Corona hit the country. One of the factors that contributed to the, the Brexit vote was immigration. And one of our viewers is, is curious whether the British are still concerned about immigration from uh, of non-Europeans from the continent um, and to what degree that plays into the current Yeah, that's a good question. I think that that was uh, high on the agenda and on everybody's mind in, in the refugee crisis, 2015, 2016. And, and that concern and that fear has really subsided because uh, immigration into the EU is not as strong as it used to be. And, and anyway, uh, I mean, that, that was the kind of irony. Um, the immigration uh, in, in those Brexiteers constituencies was basically an inner EU immigration, like, uh, you know, the Polish plumber or the Portuguese housemaids, etc. Um, that is what um, concerned many people uh, who voted Brexit. Not, not so much the Pakistani who came to, uh, you know, East London or something, but it was the, the million Poles that supposedly would take away their jobs. And, 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 and that also has receded uh, and many Poles, for instance, have gone back to their country. Um, I, I don't think uh, the immigration issue is as hot a potato as it used to be. So I'd like to, to draw on your last two postings a little bit. Um, of course, you were in, in Washington, D.C. as the ambassador here to the U.S. and then um, in London as the ambassador to the Court of St. James. Um, you talked a little bit about what Biden's election might mean for negotiations between Europe and the UK, but what do you think Biden's election might mean for the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom? Well, I mean, Brexit um, has an impact on that special relationship. Um, it's strong. <coughs> I mean, the UK and, and, and America, that's still kind of family. Uh, you know, there is um, a special kind of kinship that I think nobody can replace, uh, not the French, and or, although they all always call themselves the oldest ally, which is also true. Uh, but, but this kind of um, uh, kinship, feeling of kinship is, 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 is still strong between, you know, the societies, I, I would say. Um, in, uh, but uh, I think what is gone, at least for the foreseeable future, is that the UK can play sort of a, a mediating role between the, the, uh, the European Union and the US. Uh, so, I mean, we heard this when, when I was in, 
in London uh, said, well, yes, Brexit, but we in the future will be uh, the kind of go-between, the mediator, the one who brings the US and Europe together. I think that is over. You know, uh, this administration will speak you know, to us directly and will not go via the UK. Um, I, I'm, my, my, my sad, um, and I'm, I'm a great friend of uh, Great Britain, I, I had a wonderful time, but, but I think uh, the UK has marginalized itself, um, at least for, for the time being, with that Brexit and the way it was handled in, in the previous month. It is just less important than it used to be. Also in, in American eyes, I would say. I think, I mean, I think that's, that's very true. Um, one of the, the notes that I had written to myself was, was that Britain's global role is certainly diminished um, as, a, as a result of this. Um, but the, the question is then also how, I mean, you talked a little bit about how this might play out in the relationship between um, the United Kingdom and the United States, but what about um, the other Commonwealth countries. There was an announcement um, just yesterday that the UK and Canada plan mm -hmm. to negotiate a, a trade deal based on CETA, the, the Canadian EU trade agreement. Um, how do you see the UK perhaps um, refreshing some of its ties to the former Commonwealth countries um, as a way of reestablishing its global role? Yes, I think there's a potential here. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, they all have an interest to have strong uh, trade ties uh, with the UK and, and they will not in any way um, diminish, uh, you know, the, uh, in the give and take what they are willing to concede in, in such a difficult trade agreement um, to, to, to the UK. With countries like India, it's already a different story. You know, it's a difficult relationship. It's not a, a relationship um, without problems. And, and then if you look beyond the Commonwealth, um, you know, to, to, to conclude an advantageous trade deal with China is an uphill struggle when you are just one country instead of 28 countries, you know, where the European Union can negotiate with China. We're not negotiating a trade deal. We're just negotiating an investment protection agreement, but we are a market of, you know, 480 million or something like that, or 460 million, as opposed to 64 million or whatever the number is of UK uh, inhabitants. So that's a big difference in terms of clout. Um, and um, I, I think uh, it, 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 it'll take a, a long time until the UK can uh, extract uh, the, the kind of privileges from other countries that it had or with the European Union, um, you know, being the... Uh, neighboring block and being the destination of most of its exports. So Peter, early in our conversation, you said that you think there's a 70% a chance that um, a deal will be reached in the, the days and weeks to come. Um, for those of us who are observing what's going on um, with these Brexit negotiations, but don't quite have the Fingerspitzengefühl that you have from your time um, serving in, in the UK. What are the things that we should be watching for as we try to, to parse the direction that the negotiations might go in? Well, uh, we are in this, as I said before, we are in the very last stage. Uh, it's, it's the, um, you know, you have to imagine uh, there are, I think already 700 pages with fine print that more or less are agreed upon. And, and the remainder of, of the issues that I enumerated at the beginning of our conversation, they will then be included. If they are solved, they, they can be swiftly included into an enormous text. And this is by, we, by the way, just a footnote. 
something, of course, that will make the hard Brexiteers suspicious when this will be published, they, they, they will probably think, oh, what's in those 700 pages? Will we then be, you know, in the fine print, once again, be tied to the EU that restricts our sovereignty? And will we discover something that they discovered in the withdrawal agreement relating to Northern Ireland that they didn't like, et cetera? So, um, but, but uh, you know, we are in the last uh, stages and I think we have another seven or eight days uh, to reach a deal um, because then it has to go to the capitals. They have to look at that 700 pages because it's not an open text. It has not been sent to the capitals of the European Union, nor is it published in, in the UK. So they will have to look at it. Um, then the leaders of the 27 will get together virtually, I suppose, and, and um, give their green light or oppose some of the, um, you know, um, specialized regulations. So they have to agree. Um, and then uh, it will have to go to the European Parliament for ratification. And, and that is also a challenge. Uh, it, it's not just um, a rubber stamping exercise, but the European Parliament will also look at this and, and maybe doesn't like this or that. And all of this has to be accomplished until the 31st of December. And that's a very short time. Usually this kind of text has to be translated into hold your breath 24 or 25 languages of the European Union. I think they, in this time, they waive this uh, uh, precondition because you couldn't do that uh, into, to, uh, you know, do, do the translation into Lithuanian and, and, and uh, Portuguese and everything in, in, in a couple of days, 700 pages. So, you know, time is, is, is of essence so watch um, the next days and watch a cabinet meeting in this small group, a uh, special uh, cabinet committee meeting, maybe in the next days in, in London, and then watch the, the next sort of virtual um, uh, congregation of EU leaders, whether the thumb is up or down. In a sense, um maybe there is a little bit of a, a silver lining to COVID because we've all become a much more accustomed to meeting via Zoom. And uh, in, a, in another reality, um, perhaps some of those EU leaders would have said, we need to meet in person to yeah. discuss this. Yeah, um, yeah. But because of the timeline that you've, you've outlined, a Zoom meeting of those heads of states will be more likely. But I guess yeah. my big concern is whether it's realistic um, that the, the deal would be ratified by all of the national parliaments, which is an that's important impossible. as well. That's impossible. I mean, that's an interesting question. Is it a mixed deal or is it just a European only deal? With a mixed deal, and I'm sure there will be elements in it that uh, pertain to the national authority and, and the national uh, sovereignty of all the member states, but you couldn't have a ratification process of 27 member states parliaments in that short a time. So what they usually do is um, they agree that they um, apply the deal before ratification by member states parliaments. And you can do this with the consent of uh, the 27 heads of state and government and, and the same thing happened, for instance, with CETA, the EU trade deal with Canada, which is a, a very good one. It's still not ratified in all member states, yet it's already applied. And you, you, you need to resort to this kind of trick in order to meet the timeline at the end of the transition period, 31st of December. Well, thank you, Peter. I'd, I'd like to switch gears for the last few minutes that we have together um, to talk about the relationship between the United States 
and Europe. Of course, you know the United States very well, having served in the US early in your diplomatic career, and then for eight years, first here in New York City as the, as the permanent representative to the United Nations, and then as Germany's ambassador in Washington. Um, obviously, you are a tr true transatlanticist um, and a big supporter of a strong transatlantic relationship. How do you see the transatlantic relationship, i.e. the relationship between Washington and Brussels unfolding um, under a new administration? And specifically, do you see opportunities um, for a, a greater vibrancy in the German-American relationship? Yes, I have, uh, I have hopes, although I know that um, uh, realism is um, uh, advisable. Uh, first of all, I think we have a great chance to once again um, uh, respect each other and, and we will see a change in tonality and civilized dialogue. And that is very important. You know, we will once again have trust among us, which is the most important currency among allies. And that's already very important. I, I wouldn't say uh, that is everything, but it's a lot. Then I think we uh, should be shrewd as Europeans and not demand too much from this young administration. We should connect with the domestic priorities of uh, the new president, Corona, economic recovery, and maybe climate change, where we have a real possibility of a paradigm shift. Biden has announced he will return to the Paris Agreement. It will re-energize uh, the transatlantic relation, although at first it might be only symbolic, but never un underestimate uh, the, the importance of the climate change issue for civil society. It is the most important issue for young people here in, in, in Germany, in France, in other countries. And so this will be a great reconnection. And then of course, we have the difficult, hard issues, structural issues. And, and those are you know, security issues, trade issues. How do we deal with China? How do we deal with Russia? And, all, and, and I don't expect quick wins here. Um, but um, I expect us, uh, the Europeans, uh, I hope at least, to not come empty handed to a new administration, but with a new commitment to spend more on, on defense, to agree on a common agenda vis-a-vis -vis China, um, to re-engage in trade so that we uh, stop that uh, trade conflict between uh, the US uh, and, and, and the European Union. But those will be the hard nuts to crack. And, and we should all be realistic here in Europe, what we can achieve um, considering the constraints of the new president, the Senate, uh, the domestic priorities that he has uh, and by, by which he probably will be quite overwhelmed. And then the window of opportunity that we have, and that is pretty short until the next midterm election. So let's not overload the agenda with high hopes, but I think we will have a good start in, in reconnecting in a trustful manner as partners, allies, friends, and then we have to tackle, tackle the, the tough issues in, in the spirit of, um, you know, a commonality of, um, of democracies and in the spirit of, if we don't do it together, uh, you know, we are weaker as, uh, uh, as, as, as single units. We have to team up to tackle uh, the big security challenge and, and the challenge of China. I, I find it interesting to hear you say that um, Europe should 
temper its expectations of um, the, the Biden administration. But at the same time, it's likely that the Biden administration will have expectations of Europe. Yes. And um, I think one of the big questions on, on many people's minds is um, whether Europe is ready to meet those expectations or not. And of course, during, during your years in the diplomatic corps, the kinds of questions and issues that have come up over the last four years have not been new. Many of them have been topics um, where there has been discussion between Europe and the United States. But I wonder, do you think we're ready to open that new chapter um, of greater responsibility on the part of, of Europe, particularly at a time when the United States is domestically focused as the new administration deals with the public health crisis, the economic crisis, racial and social justice crisis that are all happening simultaneously um, and where the focus needs to be at home. Yes, I agree, uh, Steve, with you. Uh, the Europeans have got to get their act together in a way. Uh, on security, I think we have to recommit um, to a better um, burden sharing in, in defense. Uh, we have also you know, probably to arrive at a new division of labor in terms of security in our European neighborhood. Uh, you know, the US will not be the policeman of the world anymore. So we have to uh, take over a larger role, the Europeans in our neighborhood, the Middle East and North Africa. Libya, for instance, is now our issue. It's probably not an American issue. So those kind of things is where we have to deliver and offer something to the US. And in, in the tr trade area, um, we, we, we have to be pragmatic. We have, uh, we have to, uh, you know, look for the low hanging fruits and like, you know, the, the trade in aluminum tariffs, we've got to revoke them, Boeing, uh, Airbus uh, uh, conflict, um, uh, you know, the issue of taxing the digital economy, which is a potential fault line, but those things can be, uh, can be uh, resolved, I, I feel, with goodwill. Also, what's very important, um, uh, team up to reform the World Trade Organization. Uh, we should not uh, you know, uh, insist on a new free trade agreement like another TTIP upfront will not work. Let's not let's let's not focus on the most difficult things. Um, so, uh, I mean, the advice to my own um, country and and to you to, to the European Union is: don't wait until the Biden administration comes and don't wait for suggestions of the Biden administration um, how to take this transatlantic relationship forward, but let's do our homework. Let's come with something tangible that we can offer uh, to, to the US. Well, Peter, it has been wonderful to speak with you today. You've had, um, actually many of your friends have been watching our conversation today and have been online today. Um, so please know that, that we miss you uh, and we hope that we too. have a, a chance to see you when you're able to physically be at Harvard or when you're next in the United States. But I wanna thank you for, for talking with us about Brexit, but also sharing your thoughts mm -hmm. on the state of the transatlantic relationship. It was a true pleasure. I also greet um, all the friends and acquaintances of the American Council on Germany. I, I, I miss you too, and I'll come to visit uh, next time. Well, good. We look forward to it. Until then, um, stay well. And to our viewers as well, thank you for all of your questions today. And stay well and a, a happy Thanksgiving and a schöne Adventszeit to everybody. Thank you.